Let's take a deep breath. Now imagine that same breath, but from 300 million years ago. That's basically what you're burning when you drive your car. Oil and gas are time capsules of ancient life, sealed underground and pressurized like nature's own slow cooker. It sounds like magic, but it's really just chemistry, pressure, and a whole lot of dead things. But how did all of this get here in the first place? And why does so much of our modern world depend on it? What is oil and gas? Really? Let's not overcomplicate it. Oil and gas are made mostly of hydrogen and carbon atoms. They're hydrocarbons, which sounds fancy, but just means fuel that used to be alive. These fossil fuels come from tiny organisms, like plankton and algae, that lived in oceans and lakes hundreds of millions of years ago. When they died, they sank to the bottom and got buried by layer after layer of mud, sand, and pressure. Now, here's the catch. They didn't rot the way your leftovers do. That's because they were trapped in places with little to no oxygen. No bacteria to eat them, no worms to break them down, no judgmental roommate to throw them out. Also worth noting, the type of organic matter determines what gets cooked. Algae and plankton usually make oil and gas. Plants and woody material make coal. Step 1. Start with dead plankton and algae. Billions of them. Step 2. Bury them under thick layers of sediment. No peaking. Step 3. Turn up the heat. Literally. Temperatures of 120 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit are ideal. Step 4. Add pressure. We're talking thousands of pounds per square inch. Step 5. Wait, like a few million years. That's it. Eventually, those gooey remains are cooked into crude oil or natural gas. It's the ultimate slow food movement. The only thing slower might be the DMV. The deeper it gets buried, the hotter it gets. At lower temps, you get oil. At higher temps, that oil gets cracked into gas. Beyond that, everything breaks down and you get nothing but carbon sludge. This entire process happens in what's called the oil window, a temperature and pressure sweet spot deep underground. Miss the window? No fuel for you. And here's the kicker. This window isn't forever. Geological movements, faulting, uplift, and erosion can shift the location of oil reserves over time. Some oil fields might have been perfect before a mountain showed up on top. So, why is it underground? Simple. Gravity and rock and a bit of luck. Oil and gas are lighter than water, so they tend to migrate upward through porous rock, like sandstone, until something stops them. That something is called a cap rock, a dense, non-porous layer, like shale, that traps them in place. Picture Picture this, you've got an underground sponge, the reservoir rock, and on top of it, a plastic wrap, the cap rock. Oil and gas get stuck underneath and hang out there until humans come poking around with billion dollar drills. It's nature's version of Tupperware. Also, this migration takes a long time. We're talking thousands to millions of years of slow upward seepage. Some oil does make it to the surface, those are called seeps, but most of it stays locked up unless we go dig it out. And let's not forget tectonics. Plates shift, mountains rise, oceans retreat. Over hundreds of millions of years, the kitchen gets remodeled multiple times. Yet somehow these hydrocarbons find a pocket, get sealed in, and sit tight, waiting for an engineer with a spreadsheet. How do we know it's there? Humans didn't always know where to look. In fact, the first oil wells were basically educated guesses. Today, geologists use seismic waves to map underground layers. It's like doing an ultrasound on the Earth. They send sound waves down, and based on the echoes that bounce back, they get a picture of what's underfoot. They also look for things like anticlines, those arched folds in rock layers where oil might be trapped. Think of it like a bowl flipped upside down, collecting liquid. Of course, sometimes it's a bust, like ordering mystery meat at a diner. Might be treasure, might be disappointment. But when the waves look just right, the oil companies move in. They drill, they test, and if all goes well, you've got yourself a gusher. And in modern times, they bring in the big guns, supercomputers that run simulations, satellite imagery, machine learning algorithms that try to predict underground geometry. We're not just guessing anymore, we're guessing with style. Is oil really made of dinosaurs? Short answer, not exactly. Sorry, Jurassic Park, most oil comes from marine microorganisms, not giant reptiles. That said, some coal deposits do involve ancient ferns and swampy forests, so there's a little prehistoric drama involved. The idea that your gas tank is full of liquefied T-Rex is fun, but not quite accurate. Think more sea plankton smoothie than dinosaur stew. Still, it does make filling up your car sound a bit more poetic or disturbing. Depends on your mood. And fun fact, those same marine organisms are still alive today. Some scientists believe if we just had enough time and the right conditions, today's oceans could be tomorrow's fuel tank. It's like a really slow recycling program. Burning oil and gas releases energy, yes, but also carbon dioxide. This carbon has been locked underground for millions of years. Now, in just a few decades, we're putting it back into the atmosphere.
here, rapidly. This is why fossil fuels are a climate issue. It's like emptying a savings account that took millions of years to build in one shopping spree. And the Earth, it doesn't do overdraft protection. Greenhouse gases trap heat, change weather patterns, melt ice caps, and mess with ecosystems. In short, it's a mess, a convenient mess, but still a mess. Plus, oil extraction itself can cause problems. Habitat destruction, oil spills, methane leaks, political conflict. It's not just about carbon. And then there's flaring, the process of burning off excess gas. It's basically setting money on fire because it's cheaper than capturing it. Efficient? Not exactly. Wasteful? Very. Will we ever run out? Technically, yes. Fossil fuels are finite. We're using them way faster than the Earth can make more. It's like throwing a party with a 300 million year old wine collection. Once it's gone, it's gone. And we're not just running out of oil, we're running out of easy oil. The cheap, shallow, light stuff is dwindling. What's left is harder to get, deeper, riskier, and dirtier to refine. That's why people are investing in alternatives, solar, wind, geothermal, and if you're feeling futuristic, nuclear fusion. Because betting the future on more plankton deaths is not a great long-term strategy. No oil, no cars, no planes, no plastic, no synthetic rubber, no modern agriculture, no asphalt roads, no heat in winter unless you really love chopping firewood. In short, no modern world. The industrial revolution would have needed a different fuel, maybe wood, maybe whale blubber, yikes, maybe something else entirely. But we'd be decades, maybe centuries, behind where we are now. Oil wasn't just a fuel, it was a force multiplier. It let us move faster, build more, reach farther. It gave us the 20th century, and depending on what we do next, it might define the 21st too. Also, without oil, the political map might look completely different. No oil-rich nations, no petrodollar, no oil wars. It's not just an energy story, it's a story of geopolitics, economics, and power. Bonus round, oil in space? Here's a wild thought. Could oil exist on other planets? Technically, if another world had life and the right geological conditions, it could form hydrocarbons. In fact, Saturn's moon Titan has lakes of liquid methane and ethane. It's basically an oil moon, minus the dinosaurs. The idea of space oil is still sci-fi, for now. But if humans become an interplanetary species, fossil fuels might tag along as both a problem and a solution. And let's be honest, the first alien war will probably be about resources. We're very on brand that way. And hey, imagine the oil commercials. Imported straight from the Saturn system. Smooth, smoky, slightly radioactive. So next time you fill your gas tank, or turn on the heater, or unwrap a plastic package, spare a thought for the billions of micro microscopic organisms who died, sank, and simmered in the Earth's crust, just so you could have two-day shipping. Oil and gas are ancient, complex, and, let's be honest, kind of miraculous. But they're also a reminder that even the deepest resources have limits. The future? It probably looks cleaner, quieter, and less flammable. But for now, we're still living off the ghosts of oceans past. And those ghosts? They were really, really tiny. Could we make synthetic oil? That's just as good? Funny you ask. Scientists have tried making synthetic fuels, mostly during times of crisis. Not Nazi Germany and Apartheid-era South Africa both developed technologies to turn coal or natural gas into liquid fuel. These work, but they're expensive, energy-intensive, and not great for the planet. More recently, there's been interest in biofuels, making oil-like substances from corn, algae, or even household waste. These could work, especially algae, which ironically is the same stuff that made oil in the first place. Full circle. But scaling them is tricky. You can't just blend pond scum into your SUV and call it a day. Yet, still, Synthetic fuels could be a stepping stone to cleaner transportation while we scale up electric alternatives, like training wheels for the energy transition. And hey, if you ever feel small and insignificant, just remember, it only takes a few billion of your microscopic ancestors to power a global economy. No pressure.